So today I showed some very powerful descriptive analysis for the algal blooms. The space-time pattern mining tools showed spatial and temporal patterns of where algal bloom events have already occurred. What we need to know in addition to these descriptive analyses is a way to predict where algal blooms are likely to occur. Knowing when and where HABs are likely to occur can help scientists and policymakers minimize harm to people and marine life. My friend and colleague in spatial statistics team, Marjean Pabuda, will show us some exciting advances in spatial machine learning that can help us build these predictive models. Marjean. Thank you, Ankita. That was awesome. As our planet changes, we need our scientists to be able to quickly respond to new information and to provide us with the most current and up-to-date forecasts on environmental conditions that impact our way of life. As Ankita already showed, harmful algal blooms, or HABs, are occurring where colonies of algae are rapidly growing in our oceans or freshwater bodies, and they're resulting in toxic effects on people and wildlife. The illnesses caused by HABs that impact humans are incredibly dangerous, and while currently rare, if contracted, they can be debilitating or even fatal. But the threat posed by HABs goes far beyond the impact it has on people. As we all know, HABs are a major concern because of the risk they pose to our marine ecosystems and to the economies that depend on them. This is becoming a more pressing issue as the occurrence of HABs is on the rise, and they've been reported in every U.S. coastal state. So here we are looking at the data set that Ankita showed you, which is one of the most widely known HABs around the coast of Florida. Now, I'm looking at a slightly different subset here. These are algal blooms occurring from January 2000 to December 2015. And if we dive into this symbology a little bit, we can see that these algal blooms are being classified based on the presence and the prevalence of a certain single-celled organism that is known to be responsible for harmful blooms, that red tide that Ankita did such a good job of describing. So that means if I go to different areas on my map, I can see things like this area, where the toxins from blooms are not only killing marine life and making the fish caught dangerous to eat, but they're also releasing toxins into the air, making it difficult to breathe. However, there's locations such as this one, too, where those harmful algal blooms are actually not present. And this is what makes this issue so tricky. A large majority of blooms are actually beneficial because they serve as a valuable source of food for our marine life, and they're dependent upon as a source of energy that helps to drive our food chain. So how do we expect scientists to distinguish between these two vastly different possibilities? And how can we use this information to be proactive about protecting the people and the ecosystems that would be at risk due to a harmful bloom? What if we could identify conditions that help us predict where harmful algal blooms will occur and do so with high accuracy? Such a model could then be used to help us forecast what regions are most at risk in different situations, such as if ocean temperatures rise in the manner scientists would expect. So to begin that process, let's dig into this data set here on my algal blooms. This data set gives me a variety of pertinent information, especially because it was collected on the day of and at the location of my algal blooms. So it's very particular to these specific blooms, giving me information on the presence and prevalence of my certain single-celled organism that's resulting in harmful blooms, as well as measurements on the ocean, like salinity and temperature. Now, this is a really good start, but I think that there's other pieces of information that I might need to solve this problem. And so I'm also going to make use of the ecological marine units that Keith showed you. 
these marine units provide me with a variety of data pertaining to ocean nutrients that I think might be influencing these algal blooms, such as dissolved oxygen, nitrate, silicate. These are all things that I might want to include in my model. And while ecological marine units are collected across our entire ocean, they are occurring at discrete locations, specific points. And so if I want to be able to get a continuous prediction surface that I can use to extract those measurements for all of my algal bloom locations, another option to the one Keith showed you today would be to take advantage of empirical Bayesian Kriging. Now, this is the 2D version to what you saw in Eric's demo. And I can use this to essentially learn about the statistical properties of my data to quantify its spatial structure and from that to fit a model. That model is going to incorporate spatial dependence and it's ultimately what's going to be used to make my predictions at my unknown locations. Now, EBK is particularly powerful, and one of the main reasons that Eric so well described is because it's automatically calculating the parameters of this Kriging model for you through that process of creating multiple semivariograms by subsetting and simulation. So that really helps me create these beautiful prediction surfaces that I also can trust because I get measures of uncertainty with them as well. Now there's one more thing that I think I'd like to consider, and that's gonna be distance to shore. So I've located a layer for the borders of the United States. And I think I'm at a good spot to see what I can make of this and if I can build a predictive model. When it comes to predictive analytics, we have a variety of options, and it really depends what you're looking to do. Some of these methods are powerful at explaining relationships. So they look at your predictor, they look at your explanatory variables, they try to understand how they relate to one another. Others are much more geared on predictive accuracy. And the random forest algorithm is one that falls into that latter camp. Now this is a new tool that we put into the 2.2 release, the forest-based classification and regression tool. And it's what I'm going to be using to do my modeling with today. Now, the nice thing with this tool is that it's built with different modes. And the first mode that it starts with is called train only, because we know it's really darn hard to get a good model on the first run. We fully expect you to be running this multiple times with a variety of different settings to find a good fitting model. So I start in train only, I put in my input data, and the variable I wish to predict, which is, of course, classifying my algal blooms into different categories, I have the option right off the bat to either do a regression, if I was doing this on a numeric variable, a measurement, or to do a classification. I can then select my input variables from my data that I think might play an influential role in predicting the category my algal blooms are falling into, and so far, seems pretty standard for what you'd expect for a random forest algorithm. But the next thing I can do is I can actually just drop in my borders of the United States. And this is neat because what these are now is an explanatory training distance feature. So the tool will go from each input point and it'll calculate the distance to the nearest shoreline. And it does this automatically for me without any extra work on my part. That's fantastic because by default, random forest is traditionally a non-spatial method. This is a really easy way for me to incorporate location into my analysis and to see if it influences how well my model predicts. You'll also notice that my results from EBK, those rasters, I've added them as explanatory training rasters, again, as is the tool will automatically extract those values for all of my input locations. This is done through resampling with bilinear interpolation, but it's another really nice feature because even if these rasters did not overlap perfectly, the tool can handle that and it can locate the area that I have my input features and extract for those. 
So it really saves me a ton of time and lets me get to the thing that I care about most, which is trying to play around with a model. That's what I like to do. Now, the other nice thing to note here is while I am just looking around the coast of Florida, there is a big data check in place. So if you were to put in a raster for the entire world's ocean, that big data check would trigger and the tool would implement chunking which is a really nice way to know that you have the ability to work with large data. But that's all just my explanatory variables. The cool thing about this is the way that I can make sure the model I build is actually valid and good. You'll see under my advanced forest options, I have the ability to compensate for sparse categories. If I actually drill into my data here and I show you my categories, you'll see that not present is actually what's dominating my data set. And in a traditional random forest, it would actually really struggle because what it will do is it will sample most of my data from this not present category. And so when it's training my model, it's going to fail to learn how to predict the categories I really care about, where the algal blooms are actually harmful because of that bacteria being present at different levels. So this method here is actually implementing what's known as a balanced random forest. It's a modified version of the random forest algorithm that's implementing a different sampling technique to get a well-represented sample regardless of if you have a category dominating or if you have categories with smaller amounts that might not get sampled. So this allows me to use this method in a situation that ordinarily this, this method would not work to give me a good fitting model. Additionally, if I look at the ways that I can modify my forest down here, there's a lot. I can increase the number of trees. I have a variety of tuning options for me to play with how my forest is grown. And probably the most important thing, I have validation options. So I can actually control how much data is excluded for validation, for testing. This is powerful because this means that when I run this tool and I pop open these messages, I'm actually going to get a very detailed report not just on how my model fit, but actually, should I even be using random forest in the first place? I get measures like my MSE. I get to know how my explanatory variables did, how important they were at predicting what I'm trying to predict. I get diagnostics for both testing and training data sets, so I can see how my model is running on data it was trained on and how it's running on data it was never exposed to. I can also get down here measures that let me know if extrapolation is present. And if it is, maybe I want to be picking a different model. So this gives me confidence to know when I build a good model and if it applies in the situations that I'm using it in. This is so powerful and it enables me to trust and to know what I'm doing. Now that was all on training mode. So what I can do when I have a model that I like is I can actually change it to one of my other two options, which is to either predict to features or to predict to raster. Now in this case, I'm predicting to features, and what I'm opting to do here is actually play around with what happens if temperature goes up. What happens if ocean temperature increases by 0.2 degrees, 0.4, all the way up to two full degrees. Now, I really feel that the cool thing about this is that my model is enabling me to explore how my model predicts harmful algal blooms, and it allows me to increase that ocean temperature to see how that might change where it's predicting. And while I'm only using global averages for some of my explanatory variables, like dissolved oxygen, silicon, silicate, nitrate, I strongly encourage you to gain access to more timely and accurate measurements through the Argo float data to work to build your own models, to play around with these tools. Because ultimately, despite all the hurdles that we face today, it's imperative that good science does not stop in its fight to help protect society and its help to fight to help protect our planet. We do our best to build our, the tools to help you perform the research that can make a difference. 
So with that, I'm going to pass it back to Drew. Thank you so much. Thank you.